Welcome back to my reading of God Laughs at Dirty Jokes. This is the third segment in the readings. I'm going to be starting with chapter four today. If you haven't heard uh, chapters one and two and three, which are in a video together, I would recommend that you go back and check those out because this won't make much sense without it. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Um, you may notice I have a new painting. Uh, from my neighbor Rose. She lives just down the block and um, I love it. It totally matches my room. I'm super excited. Uh, she too is uh, psychic and I can't remember if Rose is in this book but she's definitely in the next book that I'm writing and she has very interesting communications with animals. Um, actually fascinating. So we'll see if she shows up in this book because I can't remember offhand um, but she definitely will show up in the future. Okay enough intro. Chapter 4 is called Flowers from Dust. Hey, Casanova, said Uncle Bill, his habitual greeting to my brother Steve. Please tell Annie I'm okay and that I love her. In 2008, Uncle Bill visited Steve within days of his fatal heart attack. He had been mowing the lawn at his home in Dunmore, Pennsylvania at the time. Our aunt found him outside with the mower still running. While alive, Uncle Bill never told Anne he loved her. Steve passed the message on to Mom, who phoned her sister. Anne was glad to hear this because she said she always wondered if he really did. One of Steve's other unusual visitors at the time was a cocky guy with a 1950s look who smoked cigarettes in a black leather jacket while dispensing bad advice about women. He once told Steve he'd bag a certain girl like a sack of groceries. Steve's other visitors have included famous and less famous artists who died, including, we believe, actor Heath Ledger and a singer-songwriter we admired named Josh Clayton Felt of the alternative rock band School of Fish. <clears throat> Excuse me. Clayton Felt died of cancer in 2000, age 32. A few years ago, Josh vis visited Steve and told him he was working on his next recording on the other side, titled Flowers from Dust. Great album title. Open parentheses, stars themselves form in great clouds of dust and radiation. As the cloud collapses, a dense core forms and gathers more dust and gas. Some of the material becomes the star, and the rest mostly becomes planets, asteroids, and comets. When stars go supernova, they see the universe with the heavier, heavier particles that eventually lead to more complex forms like us, plus every tree, animal, insect, ocean, mountain, and gold deposit. It's true that flowers are, are from dust because everything is from dust. End parentheses. I have an embarrassing connection to Josh. In the winter of 1996, my band played a gig at a college bar in Oswego, New York, about three hours from Buffalo. I'd just purchased my first four-cylinder stick shift truck. Hatchbacks like my previous car, a tiny three-cylinder Chevy Sprint that our first drummer dubbed the Roller Skate, had gone out of style and I needed something big enough to cart musical gear. My S10 was one of the early light duty trucks prone to fishtailing in icy conditions due to lack of rear weight, though I didn't know that yet. It was the also era it was also the era of top heavy flip prone family minivans, off road cartwheels at no extra charge. That's not funny, except when it's not you. Ah uh, the streets into Oswego were icy. Coming down an incline, I slid into another vehicle at a stoplight, but there was no damage. It was my first set of anti-lock brakes, and the, gl and the truck glided much more than my hatchback, which made me nervous. Foreshadowing. Uh, that night, we performed for a mostly indifferent audience of boozy college students, except for my friend Karina, who also put us up for the night. The next morning, we had breakfast at a local diner made up of a mix of townies and college students. Some of Karina's friends mocked, mocked the rural locals. I don't, care, I don't care about anyone's social status, wealth, or appearance. Everyone's equal until they prove themselves otherwise. Until, until they prove otherwise. I generally trust people who work with their hands more than number-crunching schemers in towers. That's still true. Um, I drove home with Ron, our drummer. The other guys went in a second car. I put in Josh Clayton Felt's first solo CD, Inart Inarticulate Nature Boy. 
I had seen the video for the song Window on MTV's 120 Minutes and was blown away. Mom's then boyfriend, now second husband, John, used to videotape the show for me at his house every week since we didn't have cable. Every once in a while they chose something truly unique like unusual New York City art band Hugo Largo plus Clayton Felt. Window was funky, melodic, thoughtful, well-played, modest, and inviting. So, of course, the record was destined for failure, much like my own recordings. We were listening to the second or third song when I hit a patch of ice and started to lose control of the vehicle. I was fiddling with the stereo and just put on my seatbelt at Ron's insistence. Did I have an unconscious death wish, or was I just stupidly young and cocky? The intense fishtailing began. <coughs> Excuse me. My inexperience in handling the vehicle didn't help. I felt slow motion fright like in a movie with a heightened awareness of critical fractions of seconds determining our fate. When I knew I wouldn't be able to control the truck any longer, it was simply a matter of where we would crash. There was enough time to yell, hold on. We crossed the dividing line and started spinning backwards. The truck clipped the edge of a ditch on the opposite side of the road, flipping the truck on its passenger side facing the direction from which we we'd come. The passenger window was smashed and the entire side of the truck was crushed, but we were uninjured. We climbed out the driver's side window, now facing skyward. Oh my god, oh my god, a woman from the nearest house ran out screaming. We were unintentionally nonchalant. It's okay, we're fine. An ambulance quickly arrived and took a look at our eyeballs. We were genuinely appreciative, but didn't seem to need any help. We called a tow truck to upright the vehicle and pull it from the ditch. It started up fine. We drove to a gas station to buy duct tape, covering the window entirely so that it would be less cold. The rest of the drive was uneventful. We weren't somber. We were making jokes. We were lucky. Or we just weren't meant to die that day. Within a few weeks, I had the truck repaired and it was as if it had never happened, though mom says she will never forget the stones jammed around the tire rims. Mm -hmm. Josh, the musician that I referenced, visited Steve a few years ago, at least a dozen years after the accident, and said the reason I wasn't killed was because I had more music to make. Hmm. In Steve's vision, Josh held up a copy of my then-current CD, titled Red, recorded in 2005, smiled, and said he liked it. I didn't consider his message proof of future notoriety. He was right, though. I'm still writing songs. Josh probably just wanted to be kind and encouraging, as I imagine he was when he lived, based, based on his lyrics. Josh's final record, Spirit Touches Ground, was released posthumously by his friends and family. It has some amazing songs about change, transition, essence, faith, and love that seem to anticipate his departure from Earth. In the song Waiting to Be, he sings, You're waiting to be what you already are. You're the only one left in your way. Steve and I were also deeply moved by Too Cool for This World. You're too cool for this world. You realized a long time ago you've got so much in your heart you don't even want to start. You don't want the whole world to know. Nothing seems good enough. It's so hard just getting up. But the world will be here when you rise. It still gives me chills. Like right now. Hmm. Dragonfly is the stunning closing ballad. If your road has reached the ocean but your legs still want to go. And if they taught you how to doubt it but you know it isn't so. And if the moment seemed to miss you. And if your partner isn't there. And if you know you could reach the treasure but you keep coming up for air. If you want to get through to the other side, let the dragonfly come and give you a ride. Every day you're born and every night you die. Let the dragonfly come and give you a ride. Sometimes when I listen to it, I feel he's with me, providing guidance and reassurance. Those are amazing lyrics. We can't be certain it was really Josh who visited Steve, but I choose to believe. Maybe I'll get to hear flowers from dust on the other side and we can sing some songs together. Actually, I want Josh to teach me how to play drums because he played drums on his record and he was really great at that. I haven't thought about the truck accident in many years, likely preferring to block it out and believe I couldn't have been so stupid. 
Don't we each have at least one story like that? There's such a thin line between life and death. It makes me wonder how much is faded and why some people get luckier than others. That's the end of chapter four. All right, I'm at the 10 minute mark. Uh, chapter five is called Good Vibrations and Turning into and Tuning into Universal Radio. All matter in the universe vibrates at specific frequencies. The particles that make up your body resonate constantly. The earth has a super low frequency hum that's imperceptible, imperceptible to the human ear. From conversations we've had with the other side, Steve and I have learned, Steve and I learned that when a person dies, their consciousness does live on, open parentheses. This also implies life is a virtual reality on some kind. More on that ahead, close parentheses. We'll call this the soul for convenience, but again, the name isn't important. Our contacts confirm that, that the spirit world exists on top of this one, but at a higher vibration, so it's unseen and largely unperceived by most people. Heaven isn't a separate place. It's right here almost in grasp. Sensitives are more, well, sensitive and perceptive and feel aspects of the greater reality more consistently. Immortal, disembodied spirits vibrate at a much higher frequency than the matter which makes up the visible universe we know. The more enlightened the spirit, the higher its vibration. Spirits with lower vibrations cannot communicate with or visit the more the more beautiful, purer realms of higher spirits until they achieve a degree of enlightenment that raises their vibration. However, high vibration spirits can slow and lower their vibrations to visit and communicate with lower spirits and living people. We believe that spirit vibrations are related to the authenticity, authenticity and goodness of a person while alive, though how exactly this is measured and who does the measure, measuring is hard to say. If the universe is essentially moral, then perhaps the calibrations are built in somehow, like a karmic calculator. Most people know what they're really like in their heart, even if they hide it from themselves and others. My brother will be a high vibration, higher than me and probably my mom as well, because he's more purely good, innocent, and less conflicted. My friend Mike Rorick is a recording studio engineer who's worked with me on my last two CDs. Actually, we're up to four CDs now, but I wrote this in 2014. He shares an interest in spirituality, and we often start our recording sessions swapping new ideas over morning coffee. Based on his understanding of sound, Mike speculated that when we meet others with whom we have an instant rapport, it's because there are sympathetic frequencies at work. Sympathetic frequencies, sound waves, create harmony in music. Similarly, when we get someone's vibe, we experience a pleasant feeling of connection in their presence. The phrase itself implies good vibrations are at work, like the Beach Boys song. A harmonious relationship might be felt in our bodies before we even know exactly why we like someone, which is why it's important to trust your instincts. Perhaps a gut feeling in your cells resonating harmonically, or perhaps a gut feeling is your cells resonating harmonically or dissonantly in the presence of others' vibrations trying to tell you something important about them, good or bad. Okay, then there's a little uh, pause here in the chapter, a little blind break. Uh, so this is sort of a, a new thought within the chapter. I suspect that people with antisocial maladies, yet incomprehensible brain power, and or the ability to perceive complex patterns and systems are also closer to the other side. Many geniuses, prodigies, great artists, and individuals with autism spectrum conditions seem somewhat removed from the real world that most of us understand. For example, how does a savant like British architectural artist Stephen Wiltshire recall and paint entire city skylines in intimate detail from memory? We all exist in the same physical space, but perhaps their intelligence and or afflictions elevate their awareness and interest away from this vibrational plane. They have greater powers of perception that appear and perhaps are supernatural. I mean, from our point of view. Does extreme brain power inevitably impair one's ability to socialize normally? Is it possible that the essence of God, the most unfathomable intelligence, is madness? Or at least from our point of view. In the last few years, scientists have made interesting genetic discoveries related to intellect. As part of the Human Genome Project, mapping the entirety of human DNA, 
they discovered three duplicates of a gene called SRGAP2, which is involved in brain development. Humans are the only animals known to have these extra copies. SRGAP2B and SRGAP2D are essentially junk, but SRGAP2C greatly improved the growth of brain neurons when it began showing up in our ancestors 2.4 million years ago, the same time their brains significantly increased in size. It's common for genes to be duplicated by mistake, but to some scientists, a duplicate gene that, that's responsible for greatly enhanced intelligence suggests intelligence itself may have been accidental. A genetic quirk that turned out to have a huge evolutionary advantage. The first mutated humans to possess this gene would have appeared vastly more intelligent, perhaps superhuman or alien to their peers. When they mated, they passed on the mutation, eventually leading to us. A damaged SRGAP1 gene from the same protein family as SRGAP2 can lead to developmental problems and seizures, and researchers have identified several genetic variants that are common to people with autism. Scientists are now trying to determine if mutations in SRGAP2C, easy for me to say, also lead to brain disorders, leading me to wonder if high intelligence can be considered a disorder. As we get closer to genius, do we necessarily get closer to madness? Perhaps as one nears the all-knowing aspects of God, balancing a multitude of concepts and differing perspectives, and especially contradictions, one is also closer to grasping the quantum state of infinite possibilities. It's bigger and more cosmic than most people can ha handle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is God the ultimate contradiction? Because by an embodying all creation, God is both absolute good and absolute evil and everything in between. I think that the biblical... I think of the biblical notion that to look into God's eyes is to be overwhelmed by the impossibility of perceiving all of existence, the entire universe at once. How could a limited human being stare into an all-powerful paradox and not be driven at least partly mad? I'm apparently not smart or crazy enough to pursue, pursue the thought further as much as I might like to, though perhaps I should be thankful that my understanding hits a wall that prevents me from going fully bonkers, or at least for now. Haha. <laughs> However, a correlation between genius and madness doesn't make it okay to think of oneself as Einstein just because you're really smart and don't play well with others. As David Sedaris said, there's a thin line between Asperger's and assholeism. Now, I have to admit that last line got me in trouble. Um, when I met a woman who had a son with Asperger's, she, she had been reading the book and she took a little offense at, at my making uh, a little jokey about the thin line between Asperger's and assholeism. Um, I don't really know what to say about that, except that it wasn't meant to offend, but I could see how someone might take it that way. Um, I do think there's a thin, thin line. I think if you get, this is an aside, I think if you get too down, too, too down in your ego, no matter what your mental state, it, it can be difficult um, to relate to others because you start to judge them and think of yourself as superior and that's that's just sort of a dangerous way of thinking um, to think too well of oneself or to think too little of other people and their experiences and intelligence so that's the end of chapter five um, let's see can I sneak in chapter six I can because it's a short one so we'll sneak in chapter six which is called respecting powerful forces spirits have higher vibrations than the living so when they want to communicate it communicate with us they must lower their vibration a medium like my brother steve is someone with enough purity of spirit that he can raise his vibration to, get, to communicate and meet with spirits in the middle space between realms where they overlap some spirits who visit steve and try to talk to him are incomprehensible when they speak the words sound like they've been sped up spirits have to practice lowering their vibrations so their speech becomes intelligible Steve has heard their voices change in pitch in mid-sentence when they arrive, from unintelligible to audible words, like a record playing too fast finally sliding into the proper speed. Imagine a chipmunk's vocal that keeps dropping until it sounds like a normal speaking voice. It's important to respect these forces and not treat communication with spirits as a game because what's being tapped can't be fully understood. Even people with experience like us can be manipulated by unfriendly forces, as you'll see. 
Some people deliberately or accidentally attract dark spiritual forces because there are seductive elements, but they inevitably end up being used. This idea is explored in David Lynch's creepy, fascinating movie Lost Highway and also the best TV show of all time, Twin Peaks. Almost all of Lynch's work deals with the battle between the ancient ancient eternal forces of good and evil over via surrogates on earth it's one of the reason his projects are so resonant in the movie lost highway robert blake plays an extremely intense character dubbed the mystery man he's a malevolent manipulative incarnation of darkness at a pool party attended by some young attractive la socialites of questionable character because they're peddling drugs pornography and murder the mystery man confronts Bill, Car Bill Pullman's character, a talented but troubled sax player named Fred Madison. Madison eventually murders his wife, Renee, portrayed masterfully by pa Patricia Arquette, and it's implied that the mystery man is his dark spiritual enabler and accomplice. Madison, already in league with the mystery man, but in denial as to the, the, the degree to which he's been seduced by darkness to commit murder, says to him suspiciously, have we met? The mystery man smiles and laughs ominously. You invited me in to your home. Don't you remember? In fact, I'm there right now. Madison is creeped out, phones his own home, and the mystery man answers at Madison's house while simultaneously smiling at him at the party. Ugh, that movie is so creepy. It's so well done, though. Madison invited dark forces into his life because he is angry and suspicious that his wife is having multiple, multiple affairs and is mixed up with the wrong crowd, filming snuff pornography. Madison forgets murdering her as if under possession. He's arrested, and while imprisoned, his inability to accept what he's done fractures his mind and personality. Lynch pushes things further into surreal territory. Madison literally transforms into a different person played by a different actor because he can't cope. Unfortunately, his imagined second self still can't help him avoid his fate. Robert Loge's character, Dick Laurent, is another shady fucker, a gangster who uses other people to satisfy his perverse appetite. He's one of Renee's lovers and pimps. He prostitutes her in porn flicks, and her indulgences and deceptions infuriate the jealous Madison. Laurent is also in league with Blake's mystery, Blake's devilish mystery man. Near the end of the movie, the mystery man and Madison murder Laurent. Just before he's killed, Laurent says to the mystery man, You and me, mister, we can really out-ugly the son of bitches, can't we? At which point, Laurent is dispatched from the realm of the living by a bullet from the mystery man's gun. Laurent uses and is used by something dark and twisted, and he's eventually discarded by it, just like Madison. Do not let this happen to you in real life. That's good advice still. Okay, make sure my glasses are straight. Uh, the infamous New York City serial killer David Berkowitz, son of Sam, recently claimed in an interview with the New York Daily News that he believes he committed his crimes while possessed by evil. I think this is possible, though it doesn't excuse his ac actions. The spirits only have the power over us which we allow them to have when we invite them in, like Fred Madison, Dick Laurent in the movie Lost Highway. Son of Sam doesn't deny his crimes and now advocates for the restriction of gun proliferation. Berkowitz claims to have given himself to God and spends his life sentence at Attica counseling other criminals. He said he committed his crimes at a time in his life when he was lost, tormented, and confused. When he was arrested, Berkowitz claimed that his neighbor's dog had ordered him to kill. Looking back, he now says, I tell you I felt like I was under demonic possession. I don't even recognize that person. Son of Sam represents evil and satanic things. That person is like a total stranger to me now. I have regrets more than words can say. Berkowitz isn't seeking pity. I'll be the first to say that I don't deserve to have my life spared, but I believe that but I believe God spared my life to do the things I'm doing now. I want people to see my God as a God of miracles. If he can save someone like me, he can save everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. I believe his words with all my heart. Anyone can be forgiven for the terrible things they've done, and no one is beyond redemption. I also believe he's where he should be, locked up for life. 
His relationship with God is his business and it doesn't erase the consequences of his actions. None of his victims' families are obligated to forgive him, though doing so would be an incredible spiritual feat. There's no way to know if Berkowitz was possessed when he became a serial killer, but it feels likely. I can definitely believe that a powerful dark force took advantage of his anger and alienation and, and helped twist it into a self-righteous justification to transgress and take other people's lives. Berkowitz says he felt powerful for a time, but that was a false impression and part of the delusion that evil spirits are good at perpetuating. Please be very, be very careful if you try to tap into spiritual traffic. Some people wisely prefer not to engage it because they don't trust themselves to act responsibly. Question your motives before you begin. My mom once got herself in a small bit of trouble by being insufficiently respectful of Native American spiritual, spiritual traditions. A few years ago, she told me about seeking out her animal spirit guide. She ended up having a vision where she found herself riding on the back of a wild horse that just kept gaining speed. It thrilled her for a bit, but she became frightened because she couldn't get off and didn't know how to break free or make it stop. That was her last time dabbling with animal spirits, which is best. Her intent was innocent enough, but she'd experimented with a tradition that wasn't meant for her. It's likely that some tricksters decided to have fun at her expense, teach her a lesson, or provide a warning. She was sick for some time after this, as if made unwell by the experience. She said it was creepy, but she recovered and escaped wiser. So there you have it. That's chapter six uh, of God Last the Dirty Jokes. And I'll be back soon with more chapters. So thanks for checking out my book readings. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, of course, if you have any questions about anything you've read, you're more than welcome to um, write them in the comments section below. Or you can send me an email if you like at contact at robfalgiano.com. I'll answer your question as best I can if I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just say I don't know. So there's so many mysteries among the uh, answers that we do get. Okay, hope you have a great weekend. Take care.